It's now my pleasure to welcome the star attraction, who is, although I know hundreds of people who worked at ABC News, and Kate O'Brien worked there longer than most of them, she's the only person I know of about whom I've never heard anybody else at ABC News say something nasty about. I'm not asking, right? that's always the story, isn't it? Just turn over that next rock. Uh, I'm willing to uh, go with the people I've solicited and accept the fact that she's actually a really good person even though she's now a really big boss. And uh, I can tell you all about her career. I'm going to instead hope that she tells you a little bit about it. But she was at ABC for a long time as with some people you've heard of, like I'll just mention one, David Brinkley. And uh, did a lot of great work for decades. And of course, now she faces the big challenge of running Al Jazeera America, which has uh, more baggage than even most of the people in this room. So without any more nonsense, Kate, please come up. Um, it is really, really a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Alan, and thank you, the Society, um, uh, for inviting me. It's, it's a pleasure to see a lot of people I know that I didn't expect to see here, from uh, someone I went to Sacred Heart with, McGee Hickey and I were at Sacred Heart together as, as little sprogs. Um, Someone who was in the newsroom my very first day at work, which was Mike Stein, who was a writer at World News tonight when, when I started in 1980. Uh, and someone whose daughter Emma was friends with my daughter Emma when we were both uh, working in Rome. That's Clyde Haberman, who's someplace in the back. Um, so it's, and, and many other people I've known by reputation, and uh, one gentleman who knew my father, which makes me very happy. Um, I don't know how much you know about me. I'll give you, a, really, the Cliff Notes version of me before we talk about Al Jazeera, which is really the, the thing that I want to come and talk about the most. Um, I'm, from, uh, I'm from a family of journalists. My father was a, a newspaper writer and um, had a radio show. His name was Jack O'Brien. He um, was a uh, sometimes polarizing, certainly uh, opinionated man. Um, who created a household where we looked at news all the time. I mean, the TV was on all the time because he was a TV reviewer in, my, in the early days uh, when I was a little kid. Um, so out of this household that was very aware of news sprang his two daughters, uh, Kate O'Brien, who went into television, and Bridget O'Brien, who went, went into um, newspapers. And she was at the Wall Street Journal for 18 years, and now she's at Columbia University at, at the J School. Um, so I was surrounded by news my whole life um, and wound up at ABC and, and stayed there in, in what my daughters, who are in their late 20s, say, Mom, how could you stay in one place for 30 years? Um, I think maybe some of you here did similar things. Um, I stayed at ABC for 30 years because the job kept changing and it kept being really interesting. I was in New York, I was in Washington when the Brinkley Show started, I was in the Rome Bureau for three years, I was in the London Bureau, and in those years it was, there was a lot of news overseas. It was when the Berlin Wall came down and Nelson Mandela came out and the Soviet Union fell and the first Iraq War. Um, there was just a lot going on. Uh, and then I came back and I, and I did, had a wonderful opportunity to go and work at ABC News Radio for three years with Bill Deal, who is here, um, which was in some ways the, still one of the most interesting places and, and joyful places I've ever worked. There's nothing like radio, and you guys all know that. Um, and then back to TV and into management and um, hopped around a little bit here and there, and, and my final job at ABC was to uh, run all of network news gathering, which meant our, all of our bureaus, domestic and, and overseas, and the assignment of correspondence and the coverage of breaking news. Uh, also, oversee radio, uh, overseed, uh, oversaw radio, um, oversaw our affiliate news service, and oversaw all of our, our special units, like the investigative unit, the medical unit, et cetera, et cetera. So it was a pretty wide-ranging job, which when I was called uh, by a headhunter to go and talk to people about this new channel that was coming, um, in some ways that I had never anticipated really prepared me 
for doing what I'm doing now, which is a little bit of everything. Um, uh, as I said, I wasn't planning to leave ABC. 33 years seemed pretty good, you know, another few, and I would have been done, and that would have been that. Um, but the opportunity to go to a startup where the goal was to do a different kind of journalism from what we see on the air today uh, was just too strong. It was just, it was a great opportunity. And so I left the comfort of home of ABC and wound up uh, in, I, I was quoted as saying I'm, I'm riding the wild bronco and I certainly am. It's a, it's a startup, it's uh, a well-funded startup but that doesn't mean that the spigot is on full strength uh, at all times. We still are very cognizant of budgets, and I was very sad to, when I left ABC, I thought, I will never hear the words head count again. Nah, <laughs> that's one of the first things that they asked me about. What is your head count? Um, what we're trying to do at Al Jazeera is, is something that combines what Al Jazeera media networks has done uh, in, a, in different places. Uh, I don't know how much you know about Al Jazeera media networks and how they started and, and, and you know, what, what were the early days. I'll give you a very quick um, overview of that. Al Jazeera uh, started in, in the mid-90s based on the idea of the BBC, frankly, that there could be a government-supported independent news product uh, that told news straight, essentially. Um, and this was in some ways a, a reaction to uh, the news product that was existing in the Middle East at the time, which was all government owned and therefore, you know, the, the mouthpiece of the governments and, and, you know, there wasn't really a chance for true independence. After, um, I don't know, 10, 15, 12 years, uh, Al Jazeera started an English-speaking version of Al Jazeera, which is called, oddly, Al Jazeera English. and. Uh, and that was put out globally. It happened to be you know, not great timing for the U.S. because it was um, fighting with the post-9-11 and Iraq war anti-Muslim feeling in this country and, um, and the fact that Al Jazeera English had aired the Osama bin Laden tapes um, was something that was you know, a, a point of, of discussion and the ability to, for Al Jazeera English to get on cable channels was very, very difficult. So there were a couple that accepted, but by and large, the big cable companies declined. Um, what happened after that was Al Jazeera English made its signal available online. And so for many years, Al Jazeera English, you could get it if you went onto their website. And what the folks in management at Al Jazeera realized was that the numbers that were going to the website were enormous. I mean, they sometimes had seven million uniques a month. I mean, it was for a news site, which Kind of, kind of crazy, um, which made them think, okay, let's see if we can go back around and do and get back into this market. In, in the meantime, Al Jazeera had started Al Jazeera Turkey and Al Jazeera Balkans. Their plans for Al Jazeera France, their plans for Al Jazeera UK. I'm sure Al Jazeera Espanol is coming. Um, it is a it is a an organization and uh, a brand that is well known globally and and well appreciated globally. And yet you cannot be a truly global brand if you don't have the United States. <clears throat> so the idea was, was uh, uh, put forward to come back into the American market. And the only way really, or the fastest way, wasn't the only way, the fastest way to come back into the American market was to buy a cable channel, an existing cable channel that already had deals with cable companies. And so Al Jazeera meets Al Gore and uh, um, Al Gore sold the current TV to Al Jazeera, and that was in January of 2013. And between that sale in January um, and August 5th, I'm sorry, that's when I started, August 20th, when the channel launched, um, over 750 people were hired. Um, to uh, one large newsroom uh, in New York and other newsrooms in other cities and 12 bureaus um, domestically were built, um, set up, and um, shows were created. 
you know, people were trained, piloted, um, uh, documentaries were commissioned, and we went on the air on August 20th. As I said, I started August 5th. So it was a little bit of a, of a, a rush for me to get caught up. Um, parenthetically, I started August 5th. My daughter got married August 17th. So I was, I was off that, the week after I started <laughs> for a few days. Um, but what we have done in this you know, just over six months, uh, I'm unbelievably proud of. Um, I look at the content on the air after the very shaky first few days where our first, it was Tuesday that we went on the air. That Saturday night we were black for 10 minutes. I'm sure you all noticed. Um, uh, so we had some shaky moments right at the beginning. But bit by bit, um, the, the journalists gelled into one team. The ideas were honed. The operations, you know, the hiccups were were calmed, uh, the workflow was streamlined, uh, and we have gotten to a place where I, I keep saying to people, we are so not where I want to be yet, but I am so proud of where we are at this point. I think our content is solid. I think some of our shows are better than anything that's out there. And we remain true to what is the, the Al Jazeera mission. And the Al Jazeera mission and it was, it's true of Al Jazeera Arabic and Al Jazeera English, uh, and we're, we're carrying this mission on to an American audience, is that we want, to, we want to adhere to a set of core values. And those core values are, and I wrote them down because I, it's like the seven dwarfs, you always forget one. Um, we are unopinionated. There is no question that we are unopinionated. Our, content is neither right-leaning nor left-leaning. Now, it's not to say we don't have people who are right-leaning and left-leaning on our air. We do. We want to. We want to be able to give people all the opinions that are out there on various stories. But our editorial stance is unopinionated. Uh, we try to produce stories that are underreported, whether it's on a big story, a slice of it that you're not seeing anywhere else. I'll give you an example on on uh, Crimea lately, and, we, and I'll t talk to you in a minute about how we're doing Crimea. Um, one of our correspondents did a fascinating story that I had not seen anyplace else about uh, Russian biker gangs. There's a big Russian biker gang and how instrumental this biker gang has been both in Russia, it's a, it's a very nationalistic um, uh, leaning biker gang and, and Vladimir Putin rides with them. There are nice shots of him on his hog, you know, at their conferences. But what what they were doing in Crimea because they came in in force and they were having, you know, rallies and things like that. I didn't see that anyplace else. It was fascinating. Um, so underreported stories, domestically and globally. Um, speaking of globally, we have the amazing ability to rely on the back of Al Jazeera English in some ways and also our own guts. We know that there is not on television, there is no other news organization doing as much international news as we are. We think that this is a point of differentiation. I personally think, and we have research to back it up, that there is a huge gap in the marketplace for people who are interested in what's going on around the world. And yes, people say, well, BBC America does that, Russia Today does that. Um, CCTV may do that. What we're trying to do is cover the news from around the world, but make sure it's for an American audience, because there are things that connect us as Americans to the rest of the world, and nobody, nobody is actually doing that on television right now. So it's very important that we are um, utilizing uh, everything that we can, both our own people overseas, but also the Al Jazeera English staff. We have combined 83 bureaus around the world. We have 12 bureaus in the US, which may be more than any other news organization, TV news organization right now. But 83 bureaus around the world. And the, the thinking in those bureaus is very much that we want to um, have the, the people who work in those bureaus be from those areas. Because we really think that getting news from folks who understand the area and know what's news and what's not news is the way 
you know, to get those underreported stories out or to have more expertise in certain things. So we don't really sort of send people from one end of the country to the other end of the country to, carry, to cover things. We really want to make sure our, our guy in Seattle, our woman in Dallas, they are really looking at all the news that's in that area and bringing it, bubbling it up because those are national news stories. They're just national news stories that we don't see very often. Um, investigative. Investigative is another very important part of who we are. Um, speaking truth to power is also part of who we are, and by uh, having investigative stories in as many different ways uh, as we can is, is you know, elemental um, to our values. We have had long, long, long-term investigations. Uh, actually, one um, that focused on a, a California state senator uh, resulted in his indictment. We have done shorter investigations. We've got one actually tonight on um, children's services in Florida and how they're warehousing kids who have in who should be taken care of medically in in-home care. They're warehousing them in nursing homes because there's just not enough. Uh, wherewithal to have the people going into their houses. Um, we do a weekly, and I don't think there's anybody else who does this, a weekly half-hour investigative show called Fault Lines, which is a great show, very immersive. You go with the, the you know, reporter on the scene of wherever he or she is. Some of our recent um, uh, Fault Lines subjects have been American war workers. Their fascinating story, this was on two weeks ago, fascinating story of how in our bases overseas, all the people who are the cooks, the waiters, the cleaners, are they get their jobs through third parties, and those third parties are charging them thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars for the privilege of getting a job on an American base. So they are essentially indentured servants, because then they have to work off this in most cases, it's four thousand dollars they get charged. That's a story. Actually, the feds called us after we aired that story. They want to have more information from us. Um, that's the kind of investigation that we really want to make sure is getting out there and people are aware that we are doing. Um, our other two values, and you probably gathered some of them from what I said, are to be thought-provoking and to be courageous. Um, our journalists. Um, go into places, like all journalists, um, without really thinking about their personal safety. They're thinking about the story. Um, this is true of, you know, a lot of our fault lines folks have been in the middle of war zones. A lot of our folks just period are in the middle of war zones. And it's really brought um, to the fore with the, the plight of our colleagues at Al Jazeera English and one Al Jazeera Arabic colleague who are incarcerated in, in Egypt. Um, we are over 70 days now that um, Peter Gresta, Mohammed Fazi, and Bahir Mohammed who, from AJE uh, have been incarcerated under a crazy charge of, uh, of terroristic acts. Um, they called them the Marriott cell because they found them in their office at the Marriott in, in Cairo, and when and they there was some video of when they were arrested. Some of the the spy gear that they had were computers, cell phones, lights, and a TV camera, spy gear. Um, uh, an Al Jazeera Arabic colleague has been uh, incarcerated for many more months um, uh, on, again, a trumped up charge of, of terrorism. So being courageous about what we do is a very import important part of who we are. Um, these values. We talk about them every day in the office. We talk about our mission every day. We have a morning meeting, and in the morning meeting, we talk about what we're doing, you know, what, what, what's news, what's, uh, how, how are we going to cover various stories. And we really do have the conversation of, is this, a, is this an Al Jazeera story? Does this hit our mission? Do we want to just stand in front of a building and talk on, on a microphone for eight hours, or do we really want to go deeper? And those kinds of conversations are in some ways new to me, or haven't had them in many, many years. So let me just tell you a little bit about how we're set up, our programming. We have nine hours of hard news a day, nine hours of news shows a day, starting at two in the morning, six, seven, eight, half an hour, 11, half an hour, 12, 
uh, half an hour at 2, uh, an, an hour at 4, at 6, at 8, and 11p. Those are just hard news shows. We also have primetime programming. Um, we have a, a, a money show with Ali Velshi. We have a talk show with Antonia Mora. We have a nightly magazine show with, uh, anchored by Joey Chen out of Washington where we're doing long, you know, four or five, six, seven minute pieces, multiple uh, pieces of those every night. We are very, very proud of our documentary um, uh, archive and, and the things that we've commissioned. We are trying to commission smart, interesting, cutting edge, uh, different takes on documentaries by commissioning some of the best documentarians that, that we can find out there, whether uh, we have uh, a whole series coming from Joe Berlinger, who's a great documentarian, from Alex Gibney, Oscar winning documentarian that's coming in the fall. Um, we have a, a documentary that's actually coming in April, uh, exact date TBD, where we're trying to take a, a, a subject matter and turn it on its head a little bit so that we really get people thinking about it. And the subject, don't fall asleep when I say it, is immigration. We're taking, the, the way we're doing this documentary is we're taking six people who have very strong feelings about illegal immigration and immigration in general, pros, cons, and we're setting them off on a journey to follow the lives of three people who did not make it across the border into Arizona. Um, 15,000 people die crossing the border every year and we are finding three of them and having these, these folks go and literally follow them from where they started, what were their towns, what was their family life, and then walk the walk or ride the top of the train that goes through Mexico, La Bestia, and it's called La Bestia because it is a beast, it's very, very dangerous, and then try to walk through the desert. It's very interesting and at the end of it, our, you know, our real people, it's not reality TV, it's real people, um, all think through things very differently. They have a chance to talk to ranchers on the border, they have a chance to talk to obviously the families of the people who, who did not make it across. And they and they come out with interesting perspectives on it. Some some of their minds were changed, some of them weren't. But it's a different way of actually talking about that issue. And we hope getting people to pay attention to things and think more deeply about when you talk about immigration laws, when you talk about the, the border situations, just have a little more sense of what actually goes on. So, uh, and then of course we have our digital, uh, aljazeeraamerica.com, uh, which has done very, very well. And I think um, Al, Al Jazeera is a brand, and we can talk about brand in a second. Al Jazeera is a brand that, uh, as you all know, is sort of challenged. Um, but the way it falls, and we did research on this, the way it falls in terms of the, the challenging aspect to it is a generational thing. People over the age, by and large, over the age of 35, have, have tend to have a negative view of the name of the brand because of the, the war and Osama bin Laden. People under 35 have a positive view of the brand, and that's because of Arab Spring, and they've watched it online. And so we're finding that a, lo a lot of our, our users on digital are that under 35 crowd who are coming to us because they know what Al Jazeera is and what Al Jazeera stands for. And it's very interesting. We launched and our numbers were as good as Politico, as good as Slate, as good as Salon. And we've been up and down since then, but we are doing much better online than I would have expected for, for a new-ish news organization in this country. Um, so let's talk about the brand and, uh, and some of the decisions about it. Um, before I came, there was a lot of conversation about the name. Do we keep the name? Do we change the name? What will Americans think about the name? Is it scary? Is it horrible? Uh, a lot of research was done about it. And it came down to two things. And one is that it's a global brand and it is a well-known and well-respected global brand. This country is the only country that does not feel that way, um, which is really interesting to me. Um, the second 
was the thing that I brought to the table, which is, wait a second, if we change the brand, everyone would know who we are anyway. And that would play into the, oh, you know, those guys, they're trying to be something that they're not. And going back to our values, being straightforward and having full transparency is who we want to be. So we want to get people watching us because we have good content. We want to get people over the name and watching us because we have good content. And we've done seri a series of, of research projects since we, uh, since we launched in August, and it's fascinating. Once people watch us, they come back. People who just judge us on our name are by and large sort of three to one negative. People who watch us, even when they were negative about our name, it's 92% would go on and watch us some more. So really it's about getting the eyeballs, which is why you've probably seen there's some advertising we've been doing this last month to make sure that people know in New York we're on Time Warner, Channel 57, and on Verizon, Channel 114. Um, we're working on other cable distribution deals so that we can be in more places around the country. We're in about 55 million homes at this point. And our ratings are low, but our all starting out news organizations' ratings are low. That's not a surprise to me. And I'm not going after, I'm not looking at ratings in that way. I don't live and die by ratings. It's too soon to live and die by ratings. Maybe five years from now I will, but right now we're more about getting really good quality content out there and getting the eyeballs looking at us. And I think one by one we're doing it. And I said to people time and time again, I will go anywhere and talk to anybody about our content because I believe in it so deeply. I will come to your house and turn your TV on and put <laughs> the right channel on. Because I really do think that there will be a viral effect of that. Uh, and I see it in New York. I certainly see it in New York. Um, with that, I want to open it to questions because really I didn't prepare anything, so I've been sort of babbling on notes I wrote in the car on the way over here. Um, so thank you and questions. <laughs>